and welcome to the panel discussion. Uh, this is where we get a bit philosophical or predictive and look into the future. Um, the topic today is, is very relevant to a lot of things we've been he hearing about. And actually, our panelists are representing three of our keynote speakers. So I'm going to give a very short introduction to them shortly. Um, but you've, you heard two of them this morning talking about um, quantum computing and plasma physics. And um, Maria Lisa standing in for Sylvie Gisome, who spoke yesterday about climate modeling. So we have some key applications and key technical de um, developments for the panelists. And the topic today is emerging applications, models, and implementations. And that's based on the fact that over the last decade, we've had a, a range of HPC-oriented applications, computing models and implementations being established. And some of the more recent um, developments have, have really the potential to be disruptive. To, um, or, or, so like quantum algorithms, they have the potential to uh, disrupt existing strands of research or they lead to other areas have led to a very widespread uptake beyond the classical areas, so data-driven computing. And we're gonna focus on these emerging uh, advances from a number of perspectives in the panel. So our first speaker, or what, by alphabetical order with, the, with their surnames, Maria Lees has worked for more than 20 years as a developer of the Earth System model of her institute um, at the Paris Pierre Simon Laplace Institute. Her background is in computer science and uh, applied mathematics. And as I said, she's continuing the, th the, the thread that was given by the keynote from Sylvie Jusson. Christelle Michelson gave the, the uh, keynote this morning. She's the group leader of the Quantum Information Processing Group and head of the Uli um, Unified Infrastructure of Quantum Computing at JSC. She's also professor of Quantum Information Processing at FAT Aachen. And her interests range from classical simulations of electrodynamics and quantum mechanics to quantum computing and quantum computing architectures. So um, her group has a great experience in performing large-scale simulations of quantum systems. And our congratulations again to our pre uh, Ada Lovelace winner from this year. Uh, Maria is um, an invited professor at the Institute of Superior Technical of the University of Lisbon. And her Research is focused on plasmas in extreme conditions, as we saw this morning, um, where quantum effects can affect the collective plasma dynamics. And she, as we saw, she combines an analytic theory and massively, uh, massive use of power computers and um, simulations to perform studies relevant for the state of the art and near future laser experiments using the most intense lasers in the world. So what we'll do, we've got, um, some main questions and some follow-ups, and they're grouped. And after each of the questions, we'll ask the panelists to comment. I'll then open up for questions from the stream or from, from the audience. So the first question is, is a two-part question, and it's starting with the core theme of the panel. And the, the questions are, what, in your view, are the new applications areas and methodologies with the highest impact and which ones of those fall into the category of disruptive development? So maybe you start with Maria. Thank you. Okay, this is, this is working very good. Um, thank you very much. So um, what I would like to say on this, on this uh, note is that quantum computing really has a potential to be disruptive but um, we need to work to make this happen. So the, the co there is a quantum computing community, quantum information community that has been working on algorithms for many years. And now, only now, the other fields are getting interested. Um, and only recently we have some solutions, for example, that uh, permit to treat uh, some levels of nonlinearity on, uh, on, uh, quantum, on calculations on qubits. And uh, we should really work to develop those ideas further and to be able to expand the number of problems we can uh, apply the quantum computing on uh, efficiently to be ready when the architecture is ready so that we can actually take full, full advantage of these new systems. Okay. So, Crystal, would you like to comment? Um, I, I would guess that you would, you would talk about quantum but maybe you also have a view on, on the data-driven computing as, as 
complementing that as a, a major dis potential disruptive area? Yeah, I would say there are, there are several uh, fields. Um, in the meantime, research fields that already make efficient use of HPC. But there are other fields in science which are maybe not so familiar with HPC uh, right at this moment. And one example, and this is a very much a, also a European example, is neuroscience. So the neuroscientists, they were not so familiar with HPC systems. And in the Human Brain Project, the neuroscientists and the HPC uh, community also has been brought together. And in the meantime, we see they gain a lot of expertise in the meantime. But what we also see is they don't get or they don't need so much simulation. They are more data driven, but that's, I would say that's also fine. But this is a community which has been brought to the HPC systems and not for simulation, it turns out, but mainly for data driven applications. So image analysis, um, also AI, because one has to learn and gain information from the huge amount of data they produce. So there, I would say, we also have a task to see uh, and to look for other uh, yeah, areas in science that we can also bring to the HPC system. And then this is disruptive for this community. So, turning to Maria Lees, on, on an Earth system modeling view, what, what are the major disruptive developments for you in your climate modeling area, Earth system modeling? Yes, thank you for the question. As you know, our field has a long story and uh, we are developing since uh, 50 years uh, robust uh, climate models. And so I think we have disruptive, uh, we have the challenges uh, which requires disruptive development, maybe. Uh, we have to deliver the best possible climate information for decision making. So we have to meet the user's needs from policy makers to industry, services, and the general public. And um, overall, we have to ensure the sustainability of this enlarged climate science ecosystem. And I think there are disruptive things. Okay, thanks. So coming to something that Crystal mentioned about looking at these other areas and looking at data-driven and AI approaches. And, th and those applications as drivers. How do you think they will drive computing models and the design of our future HPC resources? So this is a question for Crystal. Follow up. Yeah, what, we, what we already see now is that um, AI and these data-driven sciences also have an influence on, on the simulations. So we see that there are simulation methods that profit from machine learning because they are including data and then the machine learning and this is then taken into the simulation. So in the end one has an integration of different methods. So yeah, I would say we all influence each other and this will also be the case with quantum. So also there we have what is called quantum inspired uh, simulations and simulation methods. So then one looks at the quantum systems and what they can do, maybe that's not yet so much, but just looking into this also influences what one can then call classical simulation and okay. change their, some of these methods in a direction which is influenced by the quantum computing. Okay. So following a related question for our other two panelists, and I'll, I've got specific aspects for the two of you, but the general question is, um, as we, we hear about emerging computing models, do you think they're going to displace the existing ones? Slide. Um, or will they reduce the importance of the classical things for the future HPC design deployments or the machines that might be available for you? So, so Maria, you, you've been looking at quantum algorithms from a view of a researcher in the plasma physics field. How, how do you see that developing for you in your, your field? Okay, so 
from the user point of view, or from um, we we are we are focused on um, solving some uh, some problems or answering a physics question usually. So our our algorithm development um, uh, for these uh, parallel machines is usually always motivated by a specific physics problem. We don't just develop an algorithm just for its own sake. So I expect this kind of uh, attitude to port also to quantum computing in the future. Although now we have some, we have started some initiative even though nowadays um, the only thing we could do uh, with, uh, with the quantum computing um, setup is just to, to run a toy, toy model of a problem. So our uh, big HPC simulations are uh, still much uh, better to do, um, to do, to simulate our big plasma systems. And I don't expect this to fundamentally change um, our usage of HPC systems in the future. I think we will have a combo. There will be a, some kind of um, <laughs> system working together and I would expect maybe that uh, some uh, problems can be identified that are going to be more efficiently simulated in quantum uh, systems. And that part of the problem uh, will be simulated on the quantum simulator and the rest will be simulated on the classical HPC machine. And I think this is, uh, this is going to happen in uh, many other areas as well. I don't see uh, big parallel machines being replaced by uh, quantum computers for general purposes. I think that uh, this, this is not the way to go. And what, we, what uh, I think would motivate um, researchers to, uh, to work on getting uh, more algorithms is if we see how this in the future could solve some specific problems, which means more work has to be done in identifying the problems that would benefit from this technology, which is not, it, 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 is, uh, it is not clear. If no one is working on that, it's difficult to know what are the, the, the good problems for this. So, Maria Lise, um, your field has, been, has got really well established computer models, climate modeling, software tools. Um, do you think you'll be using some of these new methods, new possibilities in your future workflows? It's very difficult to answer. I, I, we will continue to complexify our workflow. We, we have standards to distribute the results and, um, and to build the climate information. So the, the workflow will be more and more complex with a very large set of uh, different machines and, uh, um, and so, so that's what I, I, I want to say. Okay. So at this point I'd like to ask if there are questions regarding what we've just been discussing. There is one from the stream and that is, um, I'll ask that to the panel. What is missing in the European Union in order to better support HPC and quantum computing whole or combined ecosystem? So this is coming from, from our colleagues um, in the, at the Commission. So they're asking, what can they do for you? I would say what is missing. This has been discussed already several times and it's maybe missing nowadays, but there is also don't something nowadays, and that is training and education. So in many countries, in the meantime, they start uh, introducing quantum computing in the curricula. So this means that computer scientists at the universities at least get some notice of quantum computing too. So they are aware that it exists, they are familiar with the concept. So this is a big a step forward is one, if one can introduce this. And in Germany, we also see it happen even at some high schools. So then you become familiar with it, you get some intuition, and um, this also helps, I would say. It's a new technology. People should not be afraid of this new technology. One should welcome it, and I can welcome this initiative just to play with it, toy models, and, and that's how we have to start and quickly move forward. Do either of you want to add to that? Um, well, 
maybe uh, specific um, funding schemes that uh, people can apply for that don't have to be a big uh, money allocation, something that's easier to, uh, to get to, uh, to start um, to divert some of the activity of the research group for in this direction, for example, something that could uh, pay uh, a student or some something that would motivate uh, that could motivate the younger people because I've seen um, uh, one thing that the, <laughs> the older the person is and more established they have more um, much more responsibilities and it's harder for them to start something new and especially you can say for physicists it's easier to go into quantum computing because we already have courses on quantum mechanics so we understand what's going on but uh, uh, if you're coming from another field, it's even more difficult. But I don't see um, someone that is uh, really um, long into the career that will make this step because they already have other things to do. And it's younger researchers that may uh, lead this. And sometimes even a, just one PhD student may want to do this uh, by itself, so by himself or herself. So if you can um, make some kind of uh, a funding scheme that that is not so bureaucratic and that young people can access. I think this would be very useful just to kick off these initiatives uh, to to play play around with quantum computing. So, so the answer back to the commission is: don't talk to the old guys, as they're too busy and they <laughs> won't get it. Reach out to the younger generation, training, education, give them the chance to experiment and play with these systems. Yeah, it's also a little bit of interdisciplinary research. And, and we know in all fields that's not the most easy to, as a scientist, to always score. So, and this is also with the more established scientists. They have to be willing to take a pause and stop their production um, in PhD students, uh, postdocs, publications, and so on, and really take time. It's an investment to do this. And I agree that in, in the system we have, that's rather difficult uh, to do. And there are not so many who are then doing this. So with starting with young people, that's a solution. But I can just add, so the reason why we started this project, when, uh, we, we were thinking about this for a while, but uh, then there is a foundation in Portugal uh, that's a private foundation, and they decided to give a range of scholarships for master students, um, it's called Gulbenkian Talents in Quantum Computing. And they just, okay, they, they give several scholarships a year for the, for the students to explore this topic as a master thesis. So this is, this is how we started. One student won a grant and, uh, and then uh, we figured out a project for him. And this was, um, I think it was, uh, very, it was a very exciting path and now we're going to pursue this further um, in the next years. Okay, thanks. It's hard to see from here. Are there any questions from the audience? I, th I think not at this point, but there is a follow-up to the previous question from the same source. Oh, mm -hmm. sorry. <laughs> well, we'll start with the question for the audience first. Yeah, I, I will start with, uh, with the first. Um, what do you think we need to improve more the integration of uh, industries in that, uh, in that target of uh, motivating young people, uh, improving the, the training, the education, perhaps to make more the link with, uh, with industrial target or, or, or career? So, so great minds think alike. You've covered the streaming question. So, how do we? What about industry? Uh, what about industry? I think you have a very important uh, task in bringing use cases and simplify them. So, because we as scientists, we we sometimes have either examples from our own research field or some abstract mathematical models where we can have a look at. But we are not always aware uh, of the problems that uh, industry is facing. So it's, it's very welcome that you say, I have this type of problem. Uh, can we have a look at it? But then it's all already useful that you say, okay, I can simplify it such and such. 
and then we still have something that touches the real world. It's not a real world application because the systems are too small for the calculations. But that's also the way to go. Yeah? Formulate something which is real world, which the public understands, and uh, simplify it, and then come to us. <laughs> Only? Yeah, um, so um, I think there should be a little bit more um, interaction, and I think both sides, the industry and the uh, academic um, part, they're interested to talk to each other. They have things to share, but this is on individual level. So uh, when we discussed, we organized the seminar series, Quantum for Plasmas and Plasmas for Quantum, and uh, to bring, just to bring people to talk, whoever knows something that can be useful for this bridging this gap, uh, we, invite, uh, we invite to give talks and we were inviting people from industry and they were, they were happy to participate and uh, they were happy to interact and to, to uh, share, uh, share their tools and we, we've been using, um, for example, the, the machines that are available for, for test cases and we are, we're using um, the cloud, uh, the, the ones that are available through the cloud, and it was uh, quite easy actually to talk directly to the responsible people. Uh, I think uh, this is not done on a large scale yet because uh, I, th I think that people are not aware of all these opportunities. So if uh, I th maybe organizing some more specialized events where they bring a few people together um, that uh, could benefit from each other's uh, expertise, this, this could be um, a way to improve a little bit the communication. So I said we were going to be looking ahead, um, but if you look ahead, it's often important to learn from what you achieved. So if we look at a technology push aspect and what the impact on your applications were. Um, what are the developments in programming paradigms and environments or in computational infrastructure that led you to solve the problems now that you couldn't do before? Um, so you've got the mic in your hand, so I'll start with <laughs> Maria. It's an application question, so I'm going to come to Maria Lise in a moment. But Maria, what, what were the big um, technological enablers for your capabilities in your simulations? So for the plasma physics community, uh, the existence of big machines with um, high speed network uh, in between the nodes so that we don't lose that much time to, for communication, I think this was essential to be able to uh, make big simulations of large systems that have large disparity of scales so that you, you need to simulate many cells and many particles at the same time to be able to capture the relevant physics. So um, this, this has been a big game changer. Okay, and, and Marie Elise, you, the HPC evolution has really enabled climate modeling. Right? I remember the pictures of Richardson in, in a, a, a theater going around with his torch and saying, it's your turn to compute, it's your turn. You could do a com parallel computing with people. But, but are the, the, the massive increase in capabilities that you have now partly due to new programming or modeling environments? Um, the, the main goal today is the exascale. We have to be prepared for exascale and to, okay. to organize our workflow to work with it. And we will use um, this um, power to uh, uh, include more processes, to uh, increase resolution, to go um, from uh, 100 kilometers to uh, 10 kilometers to run larger ensembles to, uh, to approach a statistical um, signal and uh, to run longer simulation for, for our, to have um, the good spin up for the ocean and slow components. And um, we have to include, um, include more components like ice sheet and so on. So um, our goal is exascale. And as Sylvie says, exa byte will come first. And we have to uh, um, really to build these complex workflows, uh, working on um, all machine required to, to extract information from this simulation coming from multimodal 
um, groups. So um, I prefer to speak about exascale, about maybe machine learning. I can add some word about it, but maybe later. Um, with the quantum computing, I'm really <laughs> speechless. <laughs> so, so linking this topic to something Crystal said earlier, he said, you know, the Rafael's not using HPC yet. And I wondered if some of the new computing or programming models and algorithms are, are cl closely linked to specific application fields. So, so for me, I always thought quantum is like cryptography. So it's, they, they go together, but obviously there are other things. Um, what are the challenges for take up of these new new computing models in other areas, so outside the usual suspects? Hard question, I know. This is indeed a hard question, yeah. Um, yeah, as I already mentioned before, this uh, looking into these quantum simulations, quantum computing inspires uh, apparently other algorithms. So there, there is quantum inspired algorithms, for example, in optimization. So we would not have had this if not so many people were now focusing on quantum computing because we would not be aware of this. And optimization is, so to speak, present in, in many uh, research fields and, and in many problems in industry. So they already profit from I would say quantum computing without actually using quantum computing. So that's one of these uh, transfer uh, elements, I would say. Okay. Um, we sort of touched on it, but um, <laughs> if we, we have these new applications that are starting to use use HPC and use HPC technology. And, but we've got well-established areas. People have been using HPC for some time. How do we do, so, so a, an example, the data analytics people are, are moving, or start, big data is starting to use HPC, but the simulation people say, yeah, we've got to worry about load balance, and we've been doing that for the last 20 years. Right? So how do you address those? How do you um, help technology transfer from the old to the new. And, and I want Marie Elise, I'll maybe ask you first, do you engage with the communities in uh, the fields addressing environmental challenges? They're not doing climate modeling. Yes, uh, as I say, it's very important to uh, answer to user needs. And uh, yes, we have to do something with uh, industrial people, with environmental um, services and uh, yes it's very important but it, it it's not the simulation part of the activity is more the um, exchange and uh, dissemination and outreach of what we we do Ma maybe I, I want to illustrate in another um, sense for example how do we approach machine learning it's okay for you sure okay so we um, we'll not re, uh, rebuild all our model with machine learning, but we are starting to use it, and um, students and um, young people are working on it. And so we use uh, machine learning to uh, analyze um, a simulation, to, uh, for example, to track the cyclone where they are. So it's possible to do that in what we call reanalysis. So. So it's um, uh, the observation uh, smooth through um, climate models. So it's possible to, um, to, to find with machine learning where uh, cyclones are. And, um, and the, the next step is to use that in si simulated results. We are able to um, use um, emulator to, uh, for example, to start the process of uh, um, tuning some part of the model. So we call it auto-tuning. So we have to run a 1,000 simulation to, uh, and it's possible to do that with some emulator to find the, the, the 
good parameter to use to find the, the set of uh, parameters to use. And um, also we, we are planning and, and st students are working on it to use machine learning for some uh, small processes included in, in the global model. So when a new technology arrives, we um, are very curious. We, we know that we have to do something with it. We know that we have to work with young people to understand uh, and to, to be smart with that. So um, that's how we, we um, are included new technology. Okay. So staying with the topic of sort of outreach, um, but looking at the areas not using HPC, what are, are some of those areas using algorithms where the HPC community has to learn how to support them? Do, it, do we have to adapt the HPC infrastructure to support these new algorithms from other areas? Or, or do those, uh, are we already covering the, the sort of algorithms that the non-HPC users actually need to use? This is an ill-posed question, but, uh, but Crystal, you've got the microphone in your hand, so I'll, I'll ask you. <laughs> yeah, so this is such a future. Um, I, I would say it's not from the future, we, we also have it now. So do we have to adapt? Um, that depends on, on, on the problem they have. Maybe we can analyze uh, the type of problems they have, the kinds of algorithms that they are using, and um, then see how they can use the HPC systems. And they can start with the smaller systems because all of us are also facing now, Exascale will be coming. And uh, we hear, of course, yeah, we need more compute time, we need to do more complex systems, and so on. But then the question is, if the machine is there, how are you going to do it? Because maybe you also have to adapt your algorithms or your way of calculating and transferring data, and so on. So, and this is then for the communities that know how to use HPC systems. But this is an, I would say this is a high tech um, field and this is under constant evolution. So this means we constantly have to adapt. And of course we have the task to take others with us who have not this long standing uh, tradition. And yeah, we can do this in different ways, but um, I think usually we have to uh, make the first step and invite them. So, also with the neuroscientists, I would say we were inviting them and see that we have some common language after a while and make them familiar and see what they can do and how they can profit because it's important that the community sees that they have a benefit from this, because that's the real motivation. And then they are willing to invest some time. So Maria, you're at the leading edge of, of HPC application use. You've just won the award, and, and uh, you, you've got massive million core simulations going on with your plasma. Um, do you want, can you comment on this? Do you, how would you support this outreach, and do you, is it something on your, on your radar? Okay, so I can answer this question from the point of view of a researcher. So, uh, you're, if you're asking someone to invest the time and energy into uh, building a code, or like working with someone to build a code, um, it is very important to ensure that this code will be useful for some time, There's, because, um, Bridging the gap between the fields always takes uh, takes some time. It's not it's not something that is done on a week scale. It's probably a scale of several years to make it uh, to get get it to the uh, big machines if if it wasn't thought for it before. So now, if these people know that um, this can uh, bring research benefits in the future for an extended period of time then they will be motivated to invest this initial work uh, much better. Um, the problem with the HPC systems of the, over the years uh, was people, there were a lot of hardware changes and 
many times a hardware change meant that you have to completely rewrite your code. So if you're not a specialist in this, uh, this, um, this is, very, this is a ve very costly operation for a research lab. So if, you, um, if, if there are some ways to ensure that uh, maybe algorithms can be ported from, uh, from one architecture to another without big changes uh, required or having some support to help the researchers do that, uh, I think this, this would uh, motivate more people to engage, uh, engage with HPC. Okay, thank Hello. you. Um, I have, uh, hi, Ramzi Tamani from Janssen. I had a question back to the public-private partnership. Actually, there's two questions. So the first one is how would you create um, an ecosystem to help uh, the relationship between the public and the partner, knowing that in this emergent technology, uh, it's a bit hard uh, on the first side to understand these new technologies. So uh, it's kind of, you know, like um, difficult because it's kind of new. And the other point is also it's multidisciplinary, so it's not only uh, computer science. So especially if we take the example of computing, so you have physics, mathematics, data science, and uh, you know the hardware component. So how could we leverage an ecosystem that could help when, let's say, an industrial come with question? So usually they don't cannot optimize on the first side how to get from you know like the problem to take it to import it uh, and. Is there a way or a mechanism you're thinking about to get an integrated approach so um, the industrial partner is somehow involved in the process, so also the need in way the building the system and the ecosystem is complying with that. And the second part of the question, let's say we, there's an alignment and excitement from both sides to start a journey of collaboration and discovery, um, is there a thought on how to accelerate the administrative procedure because that's also a big challenge when we get the scientific aligned. It takes a lot of time before starting the project. Thank you. That question was more complicated than my last one, and I'm not sure if it's all appropriate for the panel, but, but I think the aspect is, is how do you help, the, what, what's necessary for the ecosystem, how could the industry be more heavily involved? I think the administrative procedures, maybe you talk to UHPC, but, yeah, but but do I you want can, to answer? Yes, I, I can give an example from how we do this at Ulich Supercomputing Center. So for the scientific uh, communities, we have in, in Ulich what is called simulation and data laboratories. And uh, they, these are teams of uh, scientists in a particular field. So we have them in plasma physics, we have them in... Uh, Earth observation simulations, uh, climate, uh, neuroscience, and so on. So we have particular fields with experts. And these scientists have as a task to do research for 50% of their time, and 50% they are supporting the communities. So these are then the researchers coming from outside who get support by our experts for porting their codes on the system or using codes. So this is the scientific part. For the industry, we have uh, installed an office for industrial uh, relations. And there we have a few researchers who have a kind of um, yeah, also support more kind of consultancy uh, task to, uh, to discuss with the uh, researcher from, in, uh, from industry that is interested in using the machines, in using some codes. And in that sense, they also get similar support as a, as a scientist. And they can then also, under certain conditions, use uh, the supercomputers. I mean, my point is like, you know, I'm a computer scientist by training and I was working by informatics. It took me a year and a half in, in the journey in my PhD before starting to understand what the Balosh uh, are saying. So it's a matter of changing the, um, I would say, the programs at the university level to have dual competency or multiple competency people that could be the intermediate between the different scientists in the different area and also can understand the business side. And 
I think that probably would be an interesting uh, thing to, talk, to, to think about. Yes, so um, this office for industrial uh, relations is also operating in the way they are the first contact point to industrial users. But of course, we have industrial users in different fields. So if necessary, they can also involve the simulation and data labs. And we have also, and that's then on another level, we also have the algorithms, tools, and method labs. So they focus more on the algorithms and the tools and so on, while the simulation and data labs, they really have expertise in a particular field. And with this particular field also comes very often a particular algorithm. So it's this combination of these three in which we try to accelerate uh, this transfer of knowledge from science, computer science, uh, the particular research fields to industry and the other way around. Thank you. Thanks a lot. I have a question from the stream which is not directly linked to the, what we just discussed, but it's a, it's a bridge to the next topic that's coming up, which is what are the key issues for exascale? And truly energy consumption is, is one of the key ones. And the question is, I'll paraphrase it, how, how does energy efficiency impact your um, areas and what you're planning and how do you think it will impact what you're going to be doing in the future? Um, so anybody wish, wants to take that up? Plasma and energy efficiency, maybe, Maria. Well, okay. Uh, well, in terms of plasma physics, there is a major research um, regarding the clean energy the fusion, this is not my field, so I cannot comment much on that, but uh, uh, it would cer certainly be good for all of us if uh, fusion uh, turns out to be the, well, the source of the future. But in terms of computation, um, we, uh, um, so far, I don't, uh, we, I don't think this is uh, for our field, for example, we, we are not, uh, I haven't seen very much uh, people taking into account the energy consumption. Um, it's just that one thing we can do is that we try to write our codes as efficiently as possible so that our um, that we don't waste computing hours because they clearly consume time. So going to consume the energy. So um, we should try to get to the solution with the minimum uh, amount uh, of computation and what we usually do for example when we need to do those big 3d modeling that requires uh, sometimes uh, many many cpus uh, at the same time um, we we need to know a little bit about the parameters that we're going to use to be successful um, in fewer attempts so what we do is if we're doing parameter scans we try to do this we reduce geometries like 2d or we have some quasi 3d uh, versions that have a cost of 2D but have some aspects of uh, 3D uh, simulations included. So we try to um, maximize the chances of success with our 3D modeling um, before and by having this Im informed approach uh, of reduced geometry or reduced models uh, even. So this is our way of uh, ensuring that we don't, uh, don't waste uh, waste the computing time. Okay. So Maria Lise, energy is surely a key topic for, for climate change and your raison d'etre. Hmm? Uh, but have you been thinking about um, optimizing your software for energy use? So it's a very important topic and uh, um, we used to do more with more and today we have to do more with less and maybe we have to do less with lesser. So, um, yes, it's a very important thing. And we have, today, we, we have that in mind every time. So, and so, we, that's why we share results, to, to do the simulation only once, if it's a very um, costly simulation. We have to, to choose the right algorithm. We have to um, maybe reduce our ambition sometime. So it's very, very, very important. So we have to keep that in mind. We have 
to have the tools to, to measure, we have to think which kind of measure do, do we need, and uh, we have to be able to measure a lot of things inside the computer, uh, between computers and storage, and we need tools for that, and um, uh, we need to cooperate to, um, to do what really is necessary and not to waste, uh, and, and it, um, it's very new for us because uh, in <laughs> last century, we, we are happy to do more and more and more, and we discovered a lot of things, but today we have to work in a cooperative way and, and really to, to, to prepare what, which kind of simulation we have to do, why, when, for what, uh, and so on. So yes, I like this question, thank you very much. And we have a lot of things to do with that question. So the climate community, the climate modeling community, they're onto it. Crystal, I, I was listening carefully yesterday and I remember you saying with some of the new developments we're going to combine hybrid, HPC, and quantum. And even if it doesn't speed up, that may not be the issue. The main issue may be energy. Maybe you can comment. Yes, so um, the energy consumption is an important aspect also of the uh, computer centers. And there are three levels where we can pay attention to it. First of all, we have the machines. So we have to at the machine level when we are installing these infrastructures or when the manufacturers are really building these machines, they can already pay attention to this. That's a, the that's a first issue. The second one is the software. And it's not only about we have to take care that we are not wasting uh, computer time. It's also a question nowadays, what resources are we using? So do we better use CPUs? Do we better use GPUs? Do we better use GPUs from this manufacturer from another one? Because sometimes it might be better to have an algorithm that is running for a longer time, but with less energy consumption. So it's an optimization problem. And if we now have this, or in the future, we'll have these new resources like quantum computing. Quantum computers are not using a lot of energy. So most devices we have now is less than 25 kilowatts. So if you compare this to the energy consumption of our big HPC uh, machines, then even if we have a small part of our algorithm and we can put this on a quantum computer, maybe we save energy. And then this is also an important achievement. It doesn't always have to be faster. It can also have some other aspects, and energy consumption is a very important one. Thank you. We've got another question from the audience. Thank you so much. I think energy is a very important issue. I don't hear about uh, 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 research uh, centers, the computers, because they have to pay the energy. <coughs> but I'm concerned about the scientists uh, using the machines because a lot of energy can be saved, as you said, by doing the code in the right way. What are the incentives we could set that in future everyone is looking, if he's doing a code, if he's doing a job, that this is highly en energy efficient? Our intensive uh, system is not in that way. For example, could we go forward saying the H factor has a color? It's a green color or a red color? Something like that. Do you have any ideas on that? Anybody wish to say that, Marie? Uh, well, I think uh, we could start by assigning, uh, when, when, when um, someone does a simulation, we could receive uh, an information of how much the simulation consumes. This, this could probably raise the awareness a little bit <laughs> among the researchers. Yes, at the moment that's information as a user of the systems which we do not get. So we even do not know how much um, energy is um, used. We do not even know how costly our uh, simulation was. So the only no thing that we know is the walk clock time and, and some other of the, of the parameters. So it might indeed be good uh, to have a look into 
uh, these issues and also maybe then get some support. Uh, now we get support in parallelizing codes. So maybe we can also get support in making our codes more energy efficient. And, then, and I think it's a common point with industrial users. So we, we, through the energy bridge, we're coming to ever bigger machines in the exascale era. And a couple of questions, two part, and you can answer whichever you like. But what are the f research areas at the frontier of the new computing models and algorithmic development? So where are the computing model algorithmic leading edge at the moment? Uh, and the other question is, if we extrapolate from where we are now, what are going to be the game-changing applications of the future? So is it going to be plasma or is it going to be something else? Um, so either question of those. What, what are the bleeding edge algorithmic computing model developments and um, what, what are the, the next generation of, of award-winning applications going to be? Um, Maria, do you want to start? Is it going to be more plasma? Yeah, well, uh, in plasma physics, uh, I think there, whenever there is a new technology uh, available, people try it out. So you have, for example, um, a lot of uh, machine learning um, applications for optimization of certain processes. And uh, I'm sure there will be, so th there, there is some uh, interest uh, in the community of uh, looking into the quantum computing, but this is really still at this infancy. So, um, real, the, I, I do again <laughs> expect the game changer to be in so, sorts of the quantum computing, but uh, I think wider integration of existing methods that uh, already um, are shown to be very good in some areas of plasma physics, but other areas don't use them. Um, we, we could definitely benefit from that. And uh, in our, our lab, we're um, looking into uh, applications that we don't use yet uh, for, for doing some new interesting modeling and optimizations. So I think that um, if more fields are doing the same, there is still a lot of uh, uh, steps forward that could be done with uh, uh, applications that um, exist today. Okay, so on the, on the bleeding edge algorithmic development um, for, for quantum, is it the need for yet more new quantum algorithms or is it the need for the, the Fortran quantum compiler? I mean, we talked <laughs> no. about this in the post. Crystal, do you want to comment so about that? So can I just uh, comment on that first uh, one more time? So the the problem uh, with the quantum, uh, applying the quantum algorithms is that we have, the, so these quantum systems have their uh, native, um, they, they, they have their uh, behavior that uh, are really, so if you are simulating a quantum uh, process with a quantum system that's in a same, uh, that has the same, let's say, uh, topology, the, you, it's a perfect thing to do because those quantum systems are actually um, very difficult to simulate classically. They are very, it's very costly. But um, if you have something that's not easy, not obvious natively to map to a, a qubit uh, or a qubit uh, distribution, um, you have to find clever ways how to represent the problem. And this is half of the work. And then the, the simulation algorithm um, uh, can can be made only after you've represented the problem uh, in a way that uh, that uh, it could be simulated. So, Crystal, when are we going to get the Fortran compiler for quant? Uh, that's a that's a misleading question intentionally. That's indeed a misleading question, but um, quantum compilers. This is really a challenge. So many groups are looking into this. And this is really difficult. Um, one can make some uh, small steps into, uh, definitely if we are talking about these gate-based quantum computers, in combining some of these uh, gates and, and make little steps. But we also have been uh, testing some quantum compilers. 
uh, where we see that the outcome then unfortunately is worse than <laughs> that what we started from. So this already indicates it's not easy. So because so much effort has gone already into this quantum compiler, and nevertheless, you see sometimes it does not bring anything at all. So that's then uh, a little bit frustrating <laughs> sometimes. And what is leading edge? If, if you, you would ask us, um, Exascale comes, what are the research fields that will go with it, start? Material science, climate science, plasma physics, um, simulating quantum systems. So I think in energy, there are also in, in the um, energy research fields, algorithms that um, are useful for this. So these are the, will probably the front runners. These research fields uh, will be uh, the first who will uh, benefit uh, from this. And quantum, yeah, we have to see. Marie Elise, do you want to comment further on, on the, the Earth system modeling challenges for exascale? I know uh, you mentioned it earlier, but are there specific things that you say, we, we, that's, that's the big issue that we need to get solved and we need system software support, we need modeling, computer model support? Yes, I'm not sure I will answer exactly that question. We have a roadmap with a lot of things to do. So this week was a workshop organized at a worldwide level. And uh, the three questions were on, uh, um, answered during this workshop. What are the main priorities for climate models improvement and development? So we, had, we have a lot of things, but we have to discuss the priorities. What are the main model requirements to cope with societal needs for climate information? And that's really a very important thing. And the third one was with which technical development are required to cope with future hardware generations? So the community is organized and is, is uh, working on this aspect. And what I want to add is that we need people, smart people with skills, with multidisciplinary skills, we need computer scientists um, under, uh, who understand physics things. We need data scientists who understand computer things and uh, climate things. And so the, the main challenge is uh, with people. So that was an appeal for human resources support for climate modeling and earth system modeling. So I guess if anybody is interested, then they can talk to Marie Elise after the, after the uh, panel. Crystal, do you want to add something? Yeah, there is one aspect or one concept which we did not uh, discuss so far and, and which is also interesting for the bigger machines. And this is the concept of the digital twins. And I also have some personal experience there uh, from doing classical simulations, so classical electrodynamics. And we were doing this for a computer chip uh, design. And of course, you always have the limitations of, of the computer systems that one has available by then. And we saw we can already replace some of the um, aspects of chip design by doing the computations instead of doing an iterative process in the laboratories. So, and this one can drive always further by having bigger machines because then one can, in your, so to speak, digital twin, take more details in your model, more complexities with you that you know they are present, but you always have to somehow find compromises and, and simplify things depending on the compute resources that you have. So the bigger they are, the more details you can take with you. So the research fields that can work with such a digital twin will definitely have a benefit. Well, thank you for that addition. Are there any other questions from the audience? I think from the, the stream at the moment there aren't. Okay, I don't see any. So we're sort, we started early, so we're sort of out of time, but I have a last question, which is sort of, um, question to the researchers in the HPC ecosystem. 
Um, what is it they should be doing to stimulate the development of even more radically new approaches in HPC? So more radical than the hybrid quantum um, AI, IoT system. What, what, what should the ecosystem research be doing to say, we need more, we need something for the post exascale? Hard question. Does anybody want to tackle it? Marie Elise. Uh, I know that some people are thinking about the solving differential equations differently. So, good luck. So new ways to do, to do differential equations and not just finite differences. <laughs> Why not? Okay. Anybody else? Yes, yeah, so then the question is also whether you want to go from these general purpose machines to the special purpose machines, because you can always come with a particular thing you would like to be solved, and okay. then maybe you come up with a special purpose machine which the quantum computer will be anyway. Yeah. Okay. Maria, do you want to? You get the last word, maybe? Unless uh, there's another question. <laughs> uh, yeah, so uh, you just put all the buzzwords in one sentence and you <laughs> asked us what would we do beyond that. Um, so yeah, I, I really don't know what can be done uh, more because usually uh, you come you come to new ideas by working while you're learning something new and trying to bridge it with something you already know. So um, probably we will have some new developments in the future, but it's difficult to say now what they are. Then I think we've used up our time slot. Um, I'd like to take the chance to thank all of our panelists and you, the audience, for, for listening to us and for participating and posing your questions. Thank you very much.